Hello, everyone. I am only going to be up here a moment, but I wanted to say a big, uh, warm welcome to all of you. Some of you are here every day, and some of you are from far and wide. And so, um, my name is Allison Gaines Pell. I'm the head of school at Blue School, and I am um, happy to be hosting this with alongside all of you, really. I'm going to turn it over to Matt Goldman, who's one of our co-founders and our vice chair of our board, who is going to lead us through the festivities. Thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is truly exciting to uh, see the dream of Blue School be manifested in so many ways, and certainly the idea of having a Sir Ken Robinson uh, doing a book release at Blue School is one of the many parts of the Blue School dream. So thank you for making that come true, everyone in the room. Uh, no one on the planet that I know of uh, has really done more to bring attention to spearhead the idea uh, that there has to be transformation in schools and bringing creativity and passion uh, and really creating a movement uh, and a revolution. Uh, Ken's TED Talk from 2006 is uh, the most viewed TED Talk in history. Uh, <laughs> Right? Right? I think these numbers are a little bit old, but I pulled it off the web. 25 million downloads, 250 million people viewed that 2006 TED talk. Amazing. Uh, Ken has also uh, advised governments in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, on education. Um, he's received countless uh, awards and honorary degrees. And, you know, when I saw this cover and I saw a PhD at the end of Robinson's comma, PhD, I did have to ask, you know, Ken, is that one of those honorary PhDs or did you go to school? Right? It was on Monday we discussed this. And everyone in the room would be happy to know that he, that is a degree that you earned at school. And it's not just... And then there are honorary ones. A bit, but it was, I think it was a fair question. <laughs> uh, of course, Ken was knighted for his services in the arts in England. And um, I want to squash a vicious rumor the knighthood thing happened before Ken became an advisory board member, not as a result of becoming a Blue School advisory board member. As a lot, of, so let's just squash that. The internet is terrible in that regard. Uh, two years ago, and everyone thought it was one year last year, but it was actually two years ago. Ken came to this room, and. Uh, talked about Finding Your Element, and uh, a fantastic book, uh, reached the New York Times bestseller list a week later. Coincidence? <laughs> you decide. <laughs> but what's absolutely true, and what's absolutely factual, is that we are unbelievably uh, appreciative and thankful and just you have touched the Blue School community. Uh, you have given us so much of yourself and your advice and your uh, wisdom and really Ken's association with Blue School goes far beyond a professional association with the school. Uh, Terry Robinson, Lady Terry Robinson, really the brains behind the Sir Ken Robinson brand, uh, has given us so much. Uh, uh, Kate Robinson, daughter, 
uh, was a student teacher here at Blue School, and James has just been a regular fixture. So it really is a, a family affair. Um, so tonight, uh, we're here to hear Ken talk about and celebrate Creative Schools, his newest book, The Grassroots Revolution, Transforming Education. And uh, this book aggregates best practices in teaching, learning, community, uh, providing practical information for action. And the book has the potential to make a profound impact to everyone in this room, but everyone in education and beyond. And uh, we are just so proud to once again be uh, mentioned, referenced in the book uh, in relation to how the Blue School parents are a part of our community and shape our school. And, uh, and in the jacket it says, creative schools will inspire parents, teachers, and policy makers alike to rethinking the real nature and purpose of education. And to me, I, I feel like kindred spirits in that regard because that's exactly why we decided to found Blue Schools. So it is my joy and my honor to introduce Sir Ken Robinson to speak with us tonight. This is on. Uh, it's all true. <laughs> I am tremendously distinguished. <laughs> and it's a great honour for you, actually, <laughs> to have me here so informally in your midst. Um, and thank you for mentioning how many people have seen the TED Talks. It's uh, 32 million. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Um, and uh, no, uh, the, the reason I, firstly we wanted to be here to launch the book because Blue School really does exemplify so many of the values and principles and arguments that I've stood for for a long time and that we've tried to encapsulate in this book. I say we, by the way, this isn't the royal plural. Uh, it's because of my co-author, Lou Aronica, is here. Where are you, Lou? Hello. Stand up. This fact this is the third book we've done together. Um, I'll pay him off at some point and be free to write my own books. You know, but uh, while the blackmail persists, there is no alternative. <laughs> but the reason I wanted to do this book, I'll tell you, is that the TED Talks identify a problem in education. Uh, the problem is that education is badly serving our children, not through the fault of teachers, not through their intentions, it's not the purpose of schools to do that, um, but because there is increasingly a culture in education of standardization and conformity and of testing which militates against the very things that we need schools to be able to do to help our children develop. So at that TED Talk in 2006, I just wanted to call attention to it. And it has gone on to be seen by all these people, uh, as Matt approximated. And <laughs> is that all day to plan these remarks, honestly? I mean, how long does it take to go on the internet? Think about it. <laughs> Not long. Um, so, uh, it, it's been very well received, that talk. It's been seen, I think, in 150 countries, and I get emails and texts from kids, from teachers, from parents, my family, uh, <laughs> from myself, <laughs> saying how great it is. Uh, but the reason that I just want to dwell on it, it is the most viewed, because it rings a bell with people, clearly. I mean, if, if, uh, if it didn't resonate, I don't think we'd have heard much more about it. 
but I get various comments from people. For example, you know, people say to me uh, as I go about, um, you know, you tell us what the problem is, but that talk doesn't tell us what the answer is. To which I have several responses, you know, one of which is, it was 18 minutes. <laughs> Give me a break. You know, I, mean, I can't set this entire thing out in 18 minutes. The second is that I've been doing this a long time and I've actually written rather a lot about it in the past. And not just written about it, but been involved in uh, practical strategies to transform education. Do you remember Tony Blair? <laughs> Anxious looking young man. Uh, when Tony Blair was queen in England, <laughs> he, was, he, uh, he said that when he was on the campaign trail, he said if he were elected, then he would have three priorities in office, education, education, education. And, and then he was elected. And then he oversaw a series of measures in education reform, as it was called, which were largely indistinguishable from No Child Left Behind. I think I said last time I came, when we came to America, we were told various things. We've been here 14 years now. We live here. Did I mention that, by the way? You know, um, we live in America. And we were told various things. One of them is that Americans don't get irony. <laughs> this is not true, uh, but it's, it's what's said. Um, I've traveled the length and breadth of this country. I've found no evidence that it's true at all. But I think you should be aware that this is what people are saying about you behind your back. <laughs> When you leave dinner parties in America, Europeans will not run their breaths. Thankfully, nobody's ironic in their presence. It would have been a, a complete waste of time. But I knew Americans got irony not long after we got here, and I came across that legislation, No Child Left Behind. Because I thought, whoever thought of that title gets irony. <laughs> because it's leaving millions of children behind. Now, I can see that's not a very attractive name for legislation. <laughs> millions of children left behind. So. <laughs> Doesn't play in the Congress, I can see that. What's the plan, Mr. President? Well, we propose to leave millions of children behind. <laughs> and here's how it's going to work. And it's worked beautifully. Uh, currently in the States, uh, about 25% of kids who start the ninth grade do not complete the 12th grade. I, I always hesitate to call them dropouts. I don't think that's a good term. I don't think it's reasonable or fair because it puts all the blame on them. It suggests that kids have failed the system, doesn't it? It's much re more reasonable, I think, to say that the system has failed them. You know, if you were running a business and every year you lost 25% of your customer base, you might think, well, is it the business? You know, <laughs> is it us or is it these foolish customers? It would not be true to say that if you don't complete high school that you go to jail automatically. Obviously not. Some of my best friends did not complete high school. Uh, some brilliant people have gone on to wonderful lives. The vast majority of people actually who decide not to complete high school may go on to all kinds of extraordinary things. What is true is the very high proportion of people who did not complete high school, oh sorry, a very large portion of the people in the custodial system did not complete high school. Uh, it's been estimated that if America could halve the non-graduation rate among high school kids, it, about 7,000 kids a year, a, a day, drop out of high school, drop out. That's about 1.2 million a year. If that could be halved, it's been estimated that the net gain to the economy, just to take an economic factor for a moment, uh, would be over a billion dollars a year in you know, savings in social benefits, in uh, improvements in employment and so on. That's a trillion dollars over the course of 10 years. It's a big number, just economically. Of course, it doesn't happen because the prison system is itself a much bigger profit center than that. Uh, prisons are given more money for keeping people in jail than having them on probation. So there's a huge incentive in this industrial prison complex to keep people coming. Now, I don't, I don't want to argue too strongly for a conspiracy between these sectors. I'm just saying that this is a, a massive problem. And then among the kids who are in school, there's a, a tremendous waste of talent. There's a huge problem of disengagement. And meanwhile, just on the economic case, um, millions of people are unemployed despite the fact that there are millions of jobs to be filled. There is a mismatch, that's what I'm saying, between the system and it's systemic. 
So a lot of my work for a long time has been arguing that this is not just some liberal fantasy, that we are throwing away uh, our children and their lives in the most um, kind of disconsolate way. And it could be fixed. But the argument is not just economic, it's cultural, it's personal, and it's social. Now, so I've been doing this quite a while, and I gave a talk a few, uh, a few months ago, actually it was last year. Do you care when this talk was? <laughs> I can check it. You know, we're not in a rush, are we? <laughs> um, November. <laughs> last November. At the... <laughs> It was at um, a university. I'm not prepared to name it. No, in Michigan. There's Grand Valley State University in Michigan. <laughs> Last November. And I was there to speak to the students. And over lunch, one of the faculty said to me, uh, you've been at this a long time now, haven't you? I said, what's that? He said, uh, trying to change education. I said, yes, I have. He said, what is it, seven years now? I said, how do you mean, seven years? He said, you know, since that TED talk. And I said, yes, but I was alive before that. <laughs> and this is, <laughs> I was there because of all the stuff I'd been doing. So when Tony Blair was elected, um, he said he wanted to promote creativity, particularly in the school system, and then he introduced no, the equivalent of No Child Left Behind. Well, you can credit No Child Left Behind for, you know, with many achievements, but promoting creativity wouldn't be one of them, would it? That'd be pretty low down the list. So I was... I and others approached him, and this is in uh, 1999, after a long period of doing other things, and we put together, at their invitation, a national strategy to promote creativity systematically in schools. Now, I ought to say right now that, to me, creativity is just, it's both an actual concept, it's an operational idea, but it's also a metaphor for a different way of thinking about education. Um, that's why it matters to me so much. It, I'm not just talking about some specific competence. To me, it's creativity that really sets us apart from the rest of life on Earth. Not much does, that's the truth, isn't it? Not much does, truthfully. Uh, we've, we call the opening chapter of the book, now uh, the introduction, it's called One Minute to Midnight. And we were going to call the whole book that, but uh, we were convinced that Creative Schools was a better title. The reason is that human beings have been on the planet a relatively short time. Uh, the, can I ask you, how many human beings do you think there have ever been? Let, let me give you a clue here. Uh, I'm talking about modern human beings, like us. You know, groovy people <laughs> with attractive profiles and, and a sense of irony. So I'm not talking about prehistoric creatures who went round on their knuckles. Um, we were thought to have evolved about 150,000 years ago. I mean, we were cooking a long time before that. You know, but we kind of came to this magnificent conclusion uh, about 150,000 years ago. So how many of us do you think there have been? in the last 150,000 years? Eight billion. Thank you. That's it? That's it? What? What? How many? I don't know. Uh, what do you mean you don't know? <laughs> Get out. <laughs> I'll speak to you later. <laughs> no, okay. Eight I'm billion. I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. Okay. So you're, you're hedging your bets here. I can, <laughs> you're being circumspect. All right. Any non-lawyers prepared to have a go? <laughs> 11 million. 11 billion, thank you. Do I hear 20? <laughs> right, 20. <laughs> 20. <laughs> 15, thank you very much. Let me tell you, okay? Nobody knows, all right? <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> well, no, not definitely. Because we haven't been counting since the dawn of time, have we? Think about it. But if you Google the question, which is what I did, well, I'm not going to count them. If you Google the question, you will find yourself at the website of organisations like the Centre for Population Studies, where serious statisticians, you know, with no social life to speak of, have <laughs> spent years trying to figure out how many people have lived. And the closest people have got to, the, the, the number that people gather around, is it's somewhere between 80 and 120 billion. So let's split the difference. Nobody's going to sue you for it, honestly. <laughs> Let's say 100 billion people go for that. So about 100 billion people have lived in the past 150,000 years. People like us, you know, with articulate language and our sorts of sensibilities, responsibilities, hopes, aspirations, living in communities with actual cultures. About 100 billion of us. 
Here's the thing. Well, two things, really. Uh, one is that of that total, almost 10% is on the planet right now. We're the biggest population by a mile of human beings who've ever occupied the planet at the same time. About seven and a half billion of us. Whereas for most of history, there were fewer than a billion. Uh, we're heading for nine billion by the middle of the century and 12 billion by the end. If, all, if things go as they, as they are now. What are you doing? <laughs> Do you know we're having a book launch in here? <laughs> See, where were we? Did I mention, did I mention the TED Talks yet? Did I ridicule Matt for his mathematics? So, um, here's the thing. There was a program on the BBC a couple of years ago about how many people can live on Earth. It was called, How Many People Can Live on Earth? They, they have a talent for titles at the BBC. And... What the, given that we all need food and fuel and water and air to breathe, they, came to the, they said if everybody on the earth consumed those things, food and fuel and water, at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, the earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion people. So we're halfway there. But they said if everybody on earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in North America, that's us, the earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.5 billion and we're at seven and a half now. So if the whole world wants to live as we do, and they do, there's absolutely no indication that the rest of the world is prepared to take its foot off the pedal at this point. Um, by the middle of the century, we're going to need about five more planets to make this work. Well, we don't have them. Uh, what we do have is an extravagant mode of consumption and production, uh, which is, ironically, the product of human creativity. But it will not be sustainable. So, to me, the issues around education are both deeply personal. They're about giving people access to their own talents and abilities and sensibilities so they can live a life that means something. But in terms of our global development, that education could hardly be more important. Um, it's what H.G. Wells had in mind when he said in the early 20th century that civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. And I think that's right. The problem is that the education system we have now were built in the Industrial Revolution for that period. And there are three respects in which they do not uh, meet anymore the real needs and conditions of growth of, of individuals and of all of us collectively. One of them is this, that education is based on the principle of conformity, I mean, the, the current standardized system. Can I ask you, how many of you have got children of your own? All right, we're in a school. All right. Uh, and the rest of you have seen such children. Well, <laughs> small people. How many of you have got two children or more? All right. Well, I'll make you a bet. And I'm confident of winning the bet because I couldn't lose it. My bet is if you've got two children or more, I bet you they are completely different from each other, aren't they? You would never confuse them, would you? Yeah. Which one are you? Remind me. <laughs> Your father and I are constantly being confused. Can I wear some coloured t-shirts to keep it... Keep... The reason is that every human life is different. Human life is predicated on the principle, like the rest of life on Earth, on the ecological principle of diversity. People have tremendously diverse talents, interests, passions, preoccupations. Our education systems are based on the opposite principle of conformity. And as soon as you impose a principle of conformity, you naturally generate huge numbers of non-conformists who end up feeling that they are the problem. And so we invent remedial treatments to get them back with the program. I don't just mean this in terms of medication, though that's a major problem, I think, but in terms of the cultural perception of what being smart means. I know brilliant people who went through the whole of their education feeling they were stupid because they didn't feel good or interested in the things that schools, traditional schools valued most, a certain way of thinking, particularly academic work, which is very important, but there's much more to human life than that. The second principle is that education is based on the principle of compliance, which is almost the opposite of the fundamental drive that human beings have to develop imagination and, and develop their cap capacities for creativity. This is where the testing thing has become so toxic. Testing by a lot of people, I think, which has dominated the No Child Left Behind world in America, 
is often seen as some, I think people think it's some kind of benign social service that's offered to schools to help them maintain standards. Because people invoke this idea of standards as the holy grail. Well, of course, we should raise standards in schools, shouldn't we? I mean, why would you lower them? You know, I mean, it's be hard to think of a case for that. The trouble is, the standardized testing that buttresses No Child Left Behind is having suffocating effects on the whole culture of education. Can I ask you this? Um, uh, Lou and I checked this out. Actually, Lou checked it out, to be honest. Uh, but as I'm speaking and he's not, I shall take the credit for it. <laughs> what do you think were the... What do you think is the size of the National Football League, the NFL, in terms of annual revenues? What figure would you think of? 2013, I think, was the figure, Lou, wasn't it? What, no, what number do you think? Two, no reason why you would know, but if you have to think of a number, what would it be? Two billion. Uh, two billion? Fifty billion? Fifty? Three hundred million. Oh, we can tell you, it's nine billion that year. There's no reason why you would know, but nine billion. It's a nine billion dollar business, right? How about the US domestic box office for the cinema? Massive field. Bigger or smaller than the NFL? Bigger? How much bigger? It's, it's 11.2. 11.2 billion. The education testing industry in America is a $16 billion business. It's bigger than Hollywood, bigger than the NFL. The introduction of the Common Core standards in America, it's estimated, in the next couple of years, is going to cost state governments somewhere in the region, or between, or up to, I should say, up to $8 billion to impose more tests on schools. Kids in many schools now are either being tested, being prepared to be tested, or being debriefed about why they didn't do well in the test. And it's suffocating kids and it's suffocating teachers. We know this to be true. And it's all for no good reason. Because actually what we need above all are systems of education which develop people's talents, help them to leave school feeling confident, and with their full range of talents and abilities known to themselves. One of the big arguments we have in the book is that all children, really, we all do, we live in two worlds. There's a world that exists whether or not we exist. We're born, born into a world that was there anyway. A world of other people, of other things, of other objects, a world of history and so on. And of course, schools should help kids to learn about that world. But there's also a world that we live in that exists only because we exist. It's the world that came into being when we did. It's the world of our own consciousness, our own sensibility. The world that began when you did and will end or change, according to your theologies, when you do. Many of the problems that kids and all of us have in relating to the world around us originate in our misunderstanding and unease with the world within us. And yet our schools are preoccupied only with the world around us and pay hardly any attention to the world within us. You can see it in the structure of the curriculum with its emphasis on certain disciplines, the emphasis on this dry form of testing. And increasingly, of course, kids are being pathologized and medicated for not finding this very engaging. How many of you here are baby boomers? Okay, we're dying out, obviously, as a breed, isn't that thing? <laughs> How many of you have had your tonsils removed? All right, not been asked that for a while, have you? <laughs> Doesn't come up social anymore, does it, really? What's <laughs> going on with the tonsils? For my generation, I was born in 1950, my generation, um, people routinely had their tonsils taken out. That's true, isn't it? The routine thing. Um, almost everyone I knew had their tonsils removed. When I was growing up, you couldn't afford to clear your throat in public. <laughs> you know, or somebody would pounce on you and take your tonsils out. And, and not just your tonsils, your adenoids, any spare bit of flesh they couldn't account for <laughs> would be summarily removed and sent off somewhere. We don't know where it went. What happened to all the tonsils, by the way? <laughs> we don't know. This, people talk about Area 56. I mean, this is... <laughs> it's a scandal of massive proportions. The reason is, it was thought that, uh, that tonsils were toxic and that they had to be taken out in terms of, you know, to encourage health. Now, they don't think that. It was a medical fad. That's the truth. It was just a medical fashion. Now people don't think that. They treat it with antibiotics. And anyway, they think, you know, it, you'll get over it. You're better with your tonsils than not. So we suffered from a plague of tonsillectomies. 
Uh, I knew people who had their tonsils out not because they had a sore throat, but because one of their siblings did. And they thought, we'll do a job lot, it'll be quicker, just do it. Our kids don't suffer from that now. They suffer from a, a different modern plague. It's still a plague, I think. Uh, I think it's a false plague of ADHD. Now, I don't mean to say there's no such thing, but so many, really? I mean, I forget the exact figure now, but it's, it's, it's like one in 10, I think, of kids are being diagnosed with these, uh, these conditions and being put on medication to deal with it. Uh, I mean, as soon as kids start to fidget, somebody reaches for a, prescri a prescription pad. And I just don't believe it. I don't believe there's such an instance of it. I mean, the condition they're suffering from is boredom. You know, or childhood, actually, more generally. So the broad scope of the book is to say that this is a massive... Edu education reform is a massive uh, social issue. It's a massive economic issue. We're getting it badly wrong. But it's also a deeply personal one. That they, and that's the answer to it. When I said there are three principles, you know, there's conformity, compliance, the third principle on which education is based is linearity. It's the idea that you can plan your life, and education is there to help you do that. How many of you here are doing now exactly what you thought you'd be doing when you were 15? <laughs> you know, no, what I mean, you may be... Thank you, Orlando. Actually, do you mind waiting outside in that case? <laughs> no, what I mean is, you may be in an occupation you had in mind, but the life you've had where it's taken you, the things you've done. And many more people, by the way, have no idea at that age, and they're going to do something completely unexpected. Um, the thing is, you compose your life. That's my point. You create your own life. It's the best evidence we have of the energy of human creativity. Your own life is a competition. No two lives are ever the same. There are 100 billion people on the planet, but no life has ever been repeated, and nor will it. And the life you make is a lot to do with how, what you discover inside of yourself and how you affect the world around you. So what we're arguing for in the book is a shift of metaphor. We're arguing, really, that education reform, first, it's a misnomer. Uh, it's really just trying to fix something that's already badly broken. But it's, it's back to front. The, the standards movement, which is sweeping around the world, is based on the premise that the system is basically sound. We just have to tighten it up and raise standards, particularly in the so-called STEM disciplines, which, of course, are very important but they're not all important. And that the way to do that is that governments need to take control, tell people what to teach, and then test to see they've done it, and to hold teachers accountable, and to make education somehow teacher-proof. So they just carry out the instructions they're given. One of the consequences, by the way, is there was a massive turnover of teachers in schools. About 40% of teachers in America leave the profession within the first five years. And there's a huge attrition rate among head teachers because of the conditions under which they work. This is the metaphor we began. I think it should be at the heart of this. Education is modeled on industrialism. But really, nobody, I think, seriously imagines that schools are exactly like factories that create products, uh, you know, inanimate objects. I think the real metaphor here is with industrial farming. In the 19th century, the population of the Earth rocketed partly through mechanization, um, and the growth of manufacturing, but also because the same principles were applied to agriculture. Agriculture in the, in, became industrialized through mechanization, the cotton gin and the mechanical plows and so on, which made it possible to cultivate vast acres of land, vast tracts of land, as far as you could see, quickly. The second thing was the development of chemical fertilizers, which made it possible to have monocultures, so as far as you could see, because normally diverse ecosystems have their own protection, that plants protect each other. In monoculture, the, so you'd have cabbages as far as the eye could see, squash as far as the eye could see, um, pineapples as far as you could see. And the third invention was pesticides, because these plants were vulnerable. And so they were dusted with pesticides of various sorts to make them grow faster and safer. The whole output, by the way, it's been a spectacular success. Spectacular success. We're feeding more people on this basis than we ever could be, than we ever did before. Not that we could, but than we did before. Um, but of course, it's a massive industrial business. Uh, the consequence, though, is that we have we are destroying the earth along the way. We've polluted the waterways. We're eroding soils. We're making whole tracts of the planet uh, incapable of, of, uh, of growth, and we're despoiling the very environment on which we all depend for our lives. I mean, apart from that, honestly, it's been great. 
the, the industrial agriculture, which is true of plants and it's true of animals, is based on uh, conformity and compliance, but it's also based on output and yield. The whole thing is bigger and more numerous. Output. And it's, it's actually proving to be a calamity that's endangering our entire ecosystem. The alternative to industrial agriculture is organic agriculture. Organic agriculture is based on the opposite set of principles. It's based on the principle of ecology, that all plants in living systems will support and fructify each other and will be mutually enriching and supportive. It's based on the principle of fairness, so you treat all parts of the ecosystem with the same respect. Uh, so if it's a farm, it's the plants, it's the farmers, it's the whole complex. It's based on the principle of care, and it's based on the principle of, um, of uh, so care, uh, the four, aren't there? Care, <laughs> um, the ecology, fairness, and health. The real shift, though, is this, that organic farmers know that if they concentrate on the soil, everything else will flourish. So they're not focused on output and yield. They have great yield and great output, but they're not focused on the plant. They focus on the soil. And if we get the soil right, life will go on you know, forever, sustainably. I think what we've done with education is we've industrialized it. And we have an, an emphasis and preoccupation with output, with yield, you know, with test results, graduation rates, et cetera, et cetera. It's all numerical quantitative data. Uh, we're drugging people to save at the program. We're housing them in terrible conditions. And along the way, what we've done, for the most part, is undermined, eroded the culture of learning. Organic schools recognize that people flourish in certain conditions. And if you create the conditions and get them right, people will grow. They'll grow together, they'll grow with each other, they'll grow collaboratively, and they'll grow holistically. And that's what this book is about. What do those schools look like? What are they doing? And the thing about this to me that keeps, keeps us all at this is that this is not a theory. I've often been asked this. People say, well, what about your theories? You know, why do you have this theory? And I said, well, it's not a theory. It's what works. It's just what works. I've been in education my entire life. I know fantastic schools which give equal weight to the sciences, the arts, where teachers collaborate, where they work with the community, with their parents, where they value teachers, where they value the leadership of head teachers, where they work in partnership across the whole range of, of activities they engage in, and they work. Kids come out fulfilled with a sense of direction and knowing where they belong. So what we try to show in the book is how this works and where it works. But it's not meant to be an exhaustive list, but we have a whole example in the book of Blue School, uh, particularly the ecology of the school, I think it's fair to say, with the community of parents and the children and the teachers and how all those things work together. It's like any, uh, any organic process, it's never finished. It's con you need to care for it continually. You need to keep tending to it. But what we're trying to do in the book is to say that it's why it's, it, we're talking about a grassroots revolution, is that what we're trying to argue for is that these principles be applied everywhere. You see, there are fantastic schools everywhere. But they are fantastic in this sense, not because of the dominant culture of education, but in spite of it. They're, they've created some space in the system uh, to innovate. So we're saying you can, you can innovate in the system, a lot of examples of that. You can, you can make innovations to the system or you can go outside the system. But there's an ecology, eco, this, I just want to get this and conclude with it. There's an ecological metaphor that runs through the book, which is that none of this works if we don't recognize that the heart of education is learning. And it seems ridiculous to have to say it, but it is. There's a difference between learning and education. Uh, you know, if you've got children, you know that kids are, have a voracious appetite to learn. They're born with it. I mean, think what they do. In the first year or two, most kids learn to speak. I mean, you don't teach them to do that, do you? You couldn't. I mean, you wouldn't have the patience and they wouldn't have the time. <laughs> Would you? I mean, you don't, it doesn't reach a point you know, where your child's a year or 18 months old and you sit them down and say, look, we need to talk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or more specifically, you do. And, the, <laughs> and this is how it's gonna work. You know, you probably noticed that your mother and I have been making these noises for the last 18 months, and <laughs> I'm sure it's all completely incomprehensible, but, but, but some of these are actual things that, that you know, we refer to, they're objects, we call these things nouns, and, and then, you know, there's some other noises we make, which are, tell us what you're gonna do with these things, or what you have done, or, 
uh, later on what you might do in certain circumstances with them. You know, there are adjectives that describe it. This doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Uh, kids learn to speak. They absorb it from the culture. They take it in through their skin. You correct them. You encourage them. You mentor them. You coach them. But you don't teach them in the strict sense of that. Kids learn voraciously. They learn all kinds of things in the most extraordinary way. Education is a planned program of learning. The idea behind education systems is there are things that kids need to learn they wouldn't come across without our guidance, or some things that are too complicated to get their heads around without our expert help. That's the idea. For example, uh, there's a big difference between learning to speak and learning to write. Writing is a complex cultural process. You don't pick that up just by yourself. It's improbable. And nobody's got the time to invent their entire own writing system from scratch. So it helps to say, look, we've already figured this one out. Uh, we'd like you to invent calculus before now on Tuesday evening. You know, it's better to tell them how the current system works. There are cultural acquisitions along the way. The problem is that learners have stopped being at the center of education. They've become marginalized by every other type of interest, testing interests and union bargaining rates and all the rest. So if we want to get education right, what I mean by doing it from the ground up, it has to start with learners. We have to understand how they learn. So there's a whole chapter in the book on learning and what we, know, what we think we know about that. The job of a teacher is to create conditions where kids learn more effectively. So there's a chapter in the book on the art of teaching. Teaching is not a delivery system, it's an art form. Some of the most impressive people I ever met were teachers. Some of the most memorable people in my life were teachers who helped me see things I couldn't have seen before or saw something in me I didn't see before. There's a chapter in the book on the role of school principals. The job of the school principal is to create a culture in the school where all that will happen. The role of policymakers is to create a climate where people can get on and do that. And that's where the book gets us to, along with a whole section about what parents should do. That our, what we're arguing for is that you cannot change this system in the right way through command and control methods. The real uh, process of change is, is climate control. You create a climate of opportunity in which the culture of education helps people to flourish. And I say the book is full of examples how that works in all sorts of different disciplines. We're excited about it, and uh, we think it, 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 it has the potential to engage and mobilize people on, on a large scale, and that's why we're so say, keen to be here to share it. We're gonna have a Q&A in just a minute. I just want to show you a couple of things. <coughs> These are large about my holidays, so I hope you'll bear with me. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna go through all this. I, I just want to show you one little thing just towards the end. Uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> Actually, what is that? What is that? Thank you very much. No, it's been worrying me for weeks. I, 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 they'll know at Blue School. There was a, a study done a while ago of... Am I on your way? No? no? Yeah. There was a study done a while ago of cultural differences in visual perception. And in it, uh, they compared people from Southeast Asia with people in North America. The premise of this was that people from different cultures see different things and see them differently constantly. It's a very simple experiment. They sat people down in front of computer screens and showed them dozens and dozens of images and asked them to say what it was. They also had a camera that tracked their eye to see what they looked at. And they hypothesized there would be a difference, and the evidence suggested that there was. And the difference was this. The people in um, America, it could have been anywhere in Western Europe, truthfully, but people in America, seeing an image like that, typically said it's a tiger. People in Southeast Asia typically didn't. They typically said something like, it's a tiger in a jungle, or it's a jungle with a tiger, or as often as not, it's a jungle, and they didn't mention the tiger at all. Now, I'm not saying they're right and we're wrong and one's good and one's bad. It's just a difference. But it's a very interesting difference, isn't it? Because what it suggests is that according to our culture, we, it's, we're not just inclined to think about the world in certain ways. We're inclined to actually see it physically in a, in a different way. And one of the arguments or the, the explanations they put forward is that in um, North American or Western cultures, we are so preoccupied with the individual, with individualism, that our eye is naturally drawn to what we think is the subject of the picture, and we ignore the background. Whereas in Asian cultures, they argue, uh, there's a much more nuanced sense of relationships and patterns of, uh, of uh, community. And they tend, therefore, to look at the whole image. So it's just an important difference. But what it shows to me is this, that human beings, because of our 
powerful imaginations and the immense productivity of our creative capacities, we don't live in the world like other creatures do. We don't live in the world directly, so far as we can judge in the way that other creatures do. We, all of us live in a virtual reality. We live in a world of ideas, of concepts, of ideologies, of languages, of values, which incline us to see some things in particular ways and to ignore other things entirely. And you see it whenever political parties start arguing about what we should do with the country. You see it whenever faith groups get together and start to tell you what's happening. That faced with what may seem to be the same objective evidence, they give a completely different interpretation. You see it when people become emotionally disturbed. Their entire worldview is coloured by this particular frame of reference. And recognising the uh, pervasiveness of culture at every step of education is important in itself. But what it also demonstrates is that some of the most difficult things to put right are the things that we think are perfectly obvious because we just take it for granted. Like in schools, you know, we think, for example, for years, we think that's okay. This is not a way to treat people. This is um, a form of madness, I think, in terms of, I don't mean, I'm not talking about testing of any sort, or I'm not talking about accountability or raising standards, but this kind of machine attitude. What it leads to, uh, did you ever see this picture? This is what it leads to in its extremes. <coughs> did you see this image recently? This is parents in a town in India. Their kids are in that building taking a test at the end of their secondary education. And these parents are so terrified they're not going to pass, they're scaling the building literally to hand them cheat sheets for the test. This is, this is parents literally climbing up the wall. Let me just quickly show you this. Creativity and creative teaching, creative schools, is also therefore about reframing about looking at things we take for granted and trying to put a different frame around it. I came across this. It's a lovely little example of a piece of research that was in a school in Israel, and I've, I've helped to spread it around a good bit now. It speaks for itself, but here's a group of kids who have been told they'll get a point if they get the correct answer, but then halfway through, they give them a different question. Let's see what happens. Let me show you this last thing. Um, two last things. This is an experiment that, that uh, was conducted in Holland. So if you can't speak Dutch, don't worry about the subtitles. It's a very simple thing. Uh, there's a plastic tube in a table. There's a penis at the bottom. And people asked to go in there and get the peanut out. That was the task. See if you solve it.
the, the ape got it. So, so by the way, we're going to do some Q&A. So if you've got some questions on your piece of paper, do you want to pass them along to whoever's collecting them so that we can, Matt and Lou and I are going to have a conversation then with you. But uh, the reason I, I mention that is that um, creativity, creative thinking, uh, it's a multifarious set of skills, but, but it often depends upon the use of tools. Tools have done two things in human culture, among many others. But the, the principal ones are, firstly, tools extend our reach. They enable us to do things we couldn't do before, physically couldn't do it. They make us more expansive physically. But secondly, they expand our minds. They make, us be, they make us capable of thinking of things that we couldn't have imagined previously without them. You can't compose a symphony without really having access to the full panoply of the symphony orchestra. You can get somewhere along the way to it. Uh, but the tools themselves don't make the work. We still need creative minds to do it. And what I loved about that is that most people there in this experiment failed to solve it because of how they framed the question. They didn't look at the whole situation they were in. They thought the water was just if they got thirsty. And the bowl of fruit next to it, I think, made them think that. But let me put it a different way. If that bottle of water was right next to the plastic tube, everybody would have sorted it, wouldn't they? And it's often the way. We have resources available to us, but we just don't think of them because we don't think they're relevant. And what happens in schools is, I have politicians saying to me all the time, you know, we've got these terrible dropout rates, we've got disengagement, we've got all kinds of problems with teachers and turnover. Um, how do we solve these problems? And part of my argument is, well, stop causing them. <laughs> how about that? You know, start there. I, I, when I was in my 20s, I went round an abattoir in Liverpool, which is a factory for killing animals. I don't know why I went now, honestly. I, I think I was on a date, I'm not sure, but <laughs> I know how to treat a woman. You know, and, but we went around this abattoir, and it's a factory to kill animals, and it works, really. They're tremendously successful. I mean, very few get away, you know, <laughs> have reunion meetings once a year, saying that was close, you know. Um, at the end of the facility, there's a door, as I went round it, that said veterinarian. And I thought, well, why do you need a veterinarian? I mean, it's a bit late, isn't it, <laughs> for that? And I thought, he must be depressed at the end of an average day, you know, another, <laughs> another 2,000 dead animals, you know, I mean. Uh, yeah. And I, I said, well, why do you have a veterinarian? He said, well, we get the veterinarian every, every week to do random autopsies. And I thought, well, he must have seen a pattern by now, surely, you know. <laughs> There's something going on in this building. I'm going to find out what it is. <laughs> what I mean is, if you design a system to do certain things, don't be surprised if that's what it does. So if you design a system that's impersonal, that, is not, that doesn't take account of people's talents and interests, doesn't speak to their life of feeling as well as the world around them, don't be surprised if they're alienated and feel marginalized by it. Change the system, and these problems aren't solved. They just disappear. And that's what happens in great schools like this. It's what's happening in great schools around the country. People innovate within the system to avoid the problem happening in the first place. They don't solve it, they avoid it entirely. This is the last thing I want to show. I came across this recently, and I just think it's wonderful. I have nothing to do with it, uh, but it will... You know, a lot of my argument is that we have a derelict attitude to the world around us, and we have the same attitude to the people in it. And there are really two crises now. There's a crisis of natural resources and one of human resources, and we need to solve them collectively. This just, to me, is a fantastic metaphor for the depth of talent and resources available to us, if we can see it. This is in Paraguay. Mi nombre es Ada Maribel Ríos Bogado, tengo 13 años y toco el violín. Me llamo Juan Manuel Chávez, más conocido como Baby, tengo 19 años y toco el cello. Este cello está hecho de una lata de aceite, la madera tirada en la basura y las clavijas son de una vieja cuchara para golpear la carne y para hacer el ñoquis. Y suena así. Una comunidad como Cateura no es un lugar para tener un violín. De hecho, el violín, un violín cuesta más que su casa. Thank <laughs> you. 
En ese grupo acá mismo encontramos el colador de violín. Y ese que empezamos a comer el reciclado. La familia que acá vive recicla todo lo que hay en la basura y se vende. No pensaba antes que yo voy a hacer esa chumendo. Y me siento demasiado feliz cuando estoy viendo a un niño que está tocando un violín de reciclado. Cuando ya escucho el sonido del violín siento como mariposa en el estómago, así una sensación, no sé cómo voy a explicar. Bueno, la orquesta de instrumentos reciclados es una orquesta que toca instrumentos hechos con la basura. Un, dos, tres... Sin la música estaría decoreíble. La gente se da cuenta que no tenemos que tirar la basura muy fácilmente. Y no tenemos que desechar a las personas muy fácilmente. You know, there was um, do you know, Anais Nin. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I'm saying that correctly. But uh, she she wrote a little. Or she's said to have she's attributed with a small poem called Risk. It's very brief. It's four lines, I think, uh, which describes her own creative journey as a writer and her need to be true to the talents inside herself. And she said, there came a time when the risk of remaining tight in a bud was greater than the risk it took to blossom. And I think that's you know, a perfect metaphor for what we're talking about, that all our children, all our communities have these immense talents inside them, capabilities, sensibilities, and we spend a lot of time constricting them, ignoring them, riding roughshod over them, like here. But if you allow people to dig down properly into themselves and the world around them, you get extraordinary conditions for growth and change. If you change the climate. Miracles begin to happen. Um, and that's our mission, really. Not just to repair education, not just to fix it, but to help to mobilize a movement to change the entire climate in which our children are growing. Thank you. So uh, uh, I realized that at the beginning of the introduction, I was remiss to mention that there's another room full of people uh, uh, just on the other side of those walls in a uh, simulcast remote room. And then uh, we are also live streaming this over the web where 38 million people have signed up. Uh, <laughs> Or was it 38 people? I just, I, <laughs> we'll get the final numbers a little bit later. By the way, just the 25 million, 250, that was off your website. It's too late now. Just, okay, late. all right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we've compiled some questions from people in this room and, and people in, in this live stream and in the other room, and so. Uh, hey, can we bring Lua? Oh, and Lou, right, come on Lua, up. Monica. You know, it's funny, I remember reading an article in college where Paul McCartney and John Lennon were asked separately, who wrote which songs? So, 
Okay, I was going to ask who wrote which, but I, I, maybe we shouldn't. It's okay. <laughs> By the way, that it was so fascinating. They had completely different answers. Yes, that's right. You remember that? Well, yeah. Well. And they both really each separately wrote everything, so it was very confusing. Um, so the first question comes: uh, How can we get project-based learning to replace Common Core? Oh yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. But, but was that you clapping as well? <laughs> say, it's, it's not not a good look. <laughs> well, I, I'll I'll pass this through in just a minute. But uh, see, I I don't think that project-based learning, Common Core, are alternatives. Um, I mean, there are issues around the Common Core, but what? It seems to me that in itself, there isn't a problem in having some agreement on common areas of knowledge and understanding and skills that we would like all our schools to engage with. In, in the UK, we have a national curriculum. I never opposed a national curriculum. I think it's not a bad idea. It turns out when people get together to talk about what they're going to teach, they often end up teaching the same things anyhow. I don't mean you should set it out in the way that some countries do hour by hour, day by day. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that there are certain things around reading and writing, certain things if you want to teach music, it's a good thing to know and to hold these things in common. And, and the Common Core, or at least a common agreement on what should be taught at a minimum in schools, can be a great help to teachers. Um, the problem is where it becomes so reductionist uh, or becomes oversubscribed and leaves no room for discretion and also leaves whole tracks of experience out of account entirely. That's the problem. I mean, there are all issues around the Common Core, but project-based learning seems to me to be an axiomatic technique in most settings. Getting people to, and what you're about, getting people to do things collaboratively, working together on practical projects. A lot of the case studies that we've got in the book that Lou was working on uh, are of schools being turned around by kids who are totally disaffected, suddenly getting together to work on artistic, technical, practical projects. You know, it, it's not a gimmick. It's actually what works. That, that's well, true. Yeah, I think, you know, well, I think that one of the points that we make in the book that was that's so valid is that you know, in millions millions of children left behind, the the program actually doesn't dictate nearly as much as many school programs believe it to to dictate. And what happens in project based learning systems is that. There are a number of schools. There's a great school that we talk about in the book, High Tech High, um, that is completely project-based. And what they've learned is that they can exceed the, the guidelines for No Child Left Behind and, and, and the Common Core Standards and, and all those things simply by ignoring the traditional path of, of teaching to the test. And when they do project-based learning instead, they're teaching these kids everything that they need to do in order to fulfill the requirements, but they're doing it in a way that the kids actually learn something and actually embrace the, 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 you know, the embrace what they're learning and actually learn to use what they're learning. So I think I, that's. I, the, I should say too, by the way, that very few of these ideas are new or even approaching being new. You know, they've been around since we've had education. So people have some kind of collective amnesia at the policy level that this is what works. I mean, when I started out in education, my first big interest was in the use of drama teaching in schools. And teaching drama or theater or dance is a tremendously collaborative, powerful way of getting kids to learn all the things we want to. I'm not gonna put her on the spot, I wouldn't do it, but my wife Terry is here, she's, I'll point you out, can I just point you out, there she is. Put your hand up anyway, that's my wife Terry. Ter Ter Terry and I have been together now for 38 years, isn't it? Can you blame her? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. But <laughs> no, we, we work in partnership and have done all this time. Uh, we, we do everything together. And when I met Terry, I was doing, doing a research project into drama teaching, and Terry was teaching drama in a low-income school in Liverpool, very deprived area. Most kids were on free school meals, um, low-income, high unemployment, crime-ridden part of the city, and it was absolutely humming. Terry was t had 40, your classroom teacher in elementary schools, you had 42 kids in the class. It was like an Aladdin's cave. You know, if you go in every day and say, you all sit there and be quiet now, I'm gonna to talk to you for the next eight hours, 
then that's where the problems start. But if you get them on their feet, doing things, making things, working creatively, collaboratively, the whole place was humming and buzzing. And Short had a brilliant head teacher who arranged things in the school so that all the teachers taught their strengths as well as being classroom teachers. So I'm saying, it, and you know, people say you can't do this with 40 kids. Actually, truthfully, it's the only thing you can do if you've got any sense about how to do it. Get people teaching themselves, get them learning from each other. And so it, we're not inventing techniques in the book, that's all I'm saying. We're reporting on things that have been shown to work that for some reason people seem to have forgotten now and have mis or have misunderstood. And I think that might be a good segue to this question, which is it seems like we must unlearn a lot in order to live out the different ways of learning and really transform education. How might we start unlearning as teachers, parents, and humans? You know, I, I did a, an event, some of you, you were here, Matt, weren't you, that uh, Matt and I and Phil, we were all at the Vancouver Peace Summit, which is now, is it seven years ago, that now? Five, anyway. Anyway, the guest of honor there was the Dalai Lama, uh, who's a brilliant person, and at one of the sessions, he was asked a question, there were like 2,000 people there, somebody asked him this question, and we all thought, this is it, yeah, here we go, and uh, he took about a minute, it seemed, to to mull on this question. And then, you know, we're also we're sitting there metaphorically all leaning forward, thinking this is going to be great. And then he leant forward, and we thought, here it is. And he took a breath, and he said, I don't know. <laughs> I thought, what do you mean you don't know? You're, you're the Dalai Lama. You know. <laughs> we don't know. And he said, I'd never thought of that. What do you think? And I just thought that was wonderful. You know, here's one of the world's great teachers in one of the great wisdom traditions, he was perfectly happy to say, I, I don't know. You teach me. I don't know. What do you think? And that's what, something we do need to learn again, is that great teachers are also great students. Teaching isn't a monologue. It's a conversation. And nobody can know everything, and together we can know much more than we can on our own. And tapping into that collective wisdom and recognizing that students are also teachers and vice versa, that it's a conversation, not a monologue, is, I think, one of the great lessons all teachers need to remember. Well, one of the, the really subversive messages, there are many in this book, but one of the, the most subversive messages in, in this book is that if you just do it the way you think you should do it, you'll be overwhelmingly more successful than if you do it the way it seems to be prescribed to do it. And there are stories over and over of, of schools in horrendous conditions, you know, 60% free and reduced lunch, you know, 20% you know, um, you know, uh, special education, that sort of thing. Accomplishing extraordinary things by not doing anything that was prescribed, but rather looking at the kids and saying, uh, what do they need? And it is overwhelmingly successful when, when you approach it that way. I think, by the way, the other thing we need to unlearn is what a school is. You know, we've become used to the idea that schools are nine to five place or eight to six places, and there are all sorts of habits and rituals in schools that we don't need. That, and as, as Lou said, that aren't prescribed by law. People just keep doing them. You know, like we educate kids by age group. We don't do that anywhere else. We don't keep them confined to age groups outside of education. You know, families mix together. It's cross-generational. In high schools, we divide it up into 40-minute bits and pieces. It's completely antipathetic to any kind of learning environment. I mean. Things often take hours or a few minutes. To, you know, I was saying this today, if you ran a business and every 40 minutes you rang a bell and the entire workforce had to stop what they were doing, pick up their bags, go to another room with another group of people and do something else for 40 minutes, and then rinse and repeat you know, eight times a day, you'd be bankrupt in a month. Nobody would think of doing that, and yet we think it's perfectly fine in schools to do it, and it doesn't, it's, it's one of the problems. So we were careful to find in the book, we talk about schools not as the facilities we see now, necessarily. I mean, I personally am not trying to get rid of schools anytime soon. I think there is too much to gain by people being in the same room with each other. I mean, think how great it is as being in this room compared to the people in the overflow room, for example. <laughs> <laughs> think about that. Can, can, can. So, Think how much better time we're having right here right now than those people out there. So, no, but there's, there's something to be said for being in the presence of people, isn't it? That you don't get online, you don't get by 
other sorts of virtual experience. So it's what we, do, we describe schools in the, in the book as communities of learning, whatever they happen to look like. There are great homeschooling communities. There are great um, formal communities like this. But a lot of the features and characteristics are not required by law. They're just habits of mind that we've all got into and thought a school, a school must be like that. It doesn't have to be like that. It can be like this. That's what you did with Blue School. You reinvented what you, you think a school should be. Isn't that right? And look, it's been a, an amazing result. Well, there's a sensational example in, in the book of, with North Star. Um, where it's not a school at all. They, they actually, they're, they're, North Star in Massachusetts is not, um, it, it can't, doesn't qualify as a, as a school, but, but they basically reach out to kids who are, who are hungry for a learning experience, but just can't handle school. And they let them just show up at this community center and, and do whatever they want. Come and go, take a class, leave, not show up for two weeks, that sort of thing. And they have an extraordinarily high college acceptance rate coming out of this, this system because the kids are learning exactly how they want to learn on their own pace at exactly their, their time with people, without people, entirely on their own. Um, and and, it, and it's hugely successful. It's, it's the most extreme example I think we have in the book of a learning system that goes completely against the, the you know, kids in rows system, but totally works. I, I went around a, uh, a series of projects in LA a little while ago. They're called alternative education projects. We have them all over the city here, don't we, in New York. Um, these are projects that are designed to get kids back into education who for one reason or another have drifted away from it. They, have, they, they can be technology-based, arts-based, community-based, business-based, internship-based. Um, what they have in common is they work with relatively small groups that work collaboratively. They give a lot of support to the teachers. Uh, they have close community partnerships and a flexible curriculum. And they respect the individual. And they work. Uh, they have a fantastic success rate of getting kids back on track on course of their lives. What interests me is these are called alternative education. You know, and if all education were like that, we wouldn't need the alternative. <laughs> and, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make that mainstream. Is that Kate doing that? Well, you know, that Kate always does that. Yeah, when I saw that. So should we do one more question? Yeah. OK. Uh, independent private schools have the privilege of not adhering to an industrial standards-driven system. But what role can they have in changing the public system for the majority of students? OK. Well, um, uh, I'm always very keen to say that, to me, the, the difference isn't between uh, public and private, uh, necessarily. Uh, it's, it's between, as it were, good and bad. There are fantastic public schools and dreadful private schools. There are fantastic private schools and really desolate public schools. Uh, uh, most of the schools we have in the book are public schools, for the reason that I mean, I, I'm not, we're here you know, at the Blue School, I'm not a critic of, of uh, independent schools and independent education. Um, it's about how good they are. And what I like about this school is how good it is and the principles on which it's based. Uh, charter schools are seen by some politicians as the holy grail for the future education in this country. They're simply not. There's no evidence to show, for example, that, that a category of school, by being in that category, is any better than a school in any other category. Charter schools are inherently no better or worse than any other sort of schools, but they've had this sort of most favoured nation status for a while. Um, so the fact remains that, well, firstly, I think that good independent schools can be a great place of experimentation and inspiration to other people. And I think good private schools owe it to themselves, like this one does, not to be exclusive culturally or socially. Uh, they, they need to be getting their, their messages out. They need to be collaborating with people. They need to be part of the commonwealth of education. But we should also always bear in mind that for most kids in this country, in most communities, public education isn't their best shot. It's their only shot. And it really distresses me that there is a not-so-covert agenda now, politically in this country, to break up the public school system. That's what the charter movement, I think, is about. 
Um, it's what the private, privatization of schools by big corporations is about. A lot of people are investing in schools as profit centers uh, to fulfill other corporate interests. I mean, some of the big publishers are doing that. You know, they, so it's like I'm saying about, about the testing industry. We shouldn't think it's benign. I think the very well-intentioned people in it, by the way, I mean, I, I meet a lot of the people there, and I think they think on balance they're doing a good thing, but, but they're driven, the companies are driven by the bottom line. And handing over public education to private interests, I mean, big corporate interests, uh, subjects children themselves, uh, or casts them in the role of, um, uh, or puts them in the service of profit. And the great gift of public education is that we separate the public good from profit. So, as I say, I don't have an ideological problem with, with independent schools, um, provided they're part of the Commonwealth. Yeah, and I think, I think the, the, the best thing that, that everybody in this room can do is spread the word. You know, because I think that you know what you know. What I, I live in Stanford, Connecticut, which is has a very large, very challenged um, education, public education system. And one of the things I said to Ken when we started working on this this book was, I can't wait to help you write this book because I can't wait to read it because we so desperately need this in my hometown. And one of the things that we're you know, we, I think we effectively did in the book, and we very actively chose to use as many public school examples as we possibly could because we, we didn't want to hear what I keep hearing in Stanford, which is, well, you know, the, 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 you know it's too diverse, you know, we don't have the resources, you know, you know the, the state government won't let us do it, that sort of thing. We wanted to show people in exactly those, those situations, or much worse, doing incredibly creative things and I think what's amazing about this school and you know what I hope you're all doing is proselytizing what is happening in this school to people who don't have access to the school because it might light a spark in a principal or in a teacher or someone who can serve the public you know the, the public community in a way that you know people don't have access to here. I agree. I had no idea you had such selfish reasons for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit upsetting, actually, to hear. <laughs> Look, we're going to have to wrap up. I'm going to give the final word, obviously, to Matt, because we're here at Blue School. Um, but I just want to thank a, a couple of people just before we're done. I mean, firstly, obviously, all of you for coming. But, and there are lots of friends here, too. But I just want to point out some people who are actually involved directly in getting this book done. Uh, firstly, I wanted to point out Peter Miller over there. Peter, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Peter is our Peter is our literary agent who negotiates all our arrangements. We also have, uh, I think, 24 foreign language editions of other books that Peter has been wonderful in putting together. So thank you so much, Peter, for all of that. Um, we've got uh, some of uh, the key people from Viking. Uh, Press who are publishing the book and have worked with us throughout in getting this book into the current shape. So, can I embarrass you and ask you just to stand up so we can recognise it? They've done a wonderful job on this book, and I want to thank them for it. And obviously, we need to thank Matt and the whole team. I'm sure you're going to do that. But can I just before he does, can I offer you our personal thanks? to Blue School for hosting us and for all the camaraderie and friendship and inspiration you give us, Matt. Thank you. And I do publicly want to thank Terry for all that she does to make all this happen and to keep us on track. So, uh, as one does in a book release. Uh, there are books available, uh, specifically creative schools, but some of the other ones have you missed them. Uh, and so Ken is going to do some personalized signing, I believe, right here. No, right here in this spot. And so if you want to uh, get uh, have Ken sign a book, and then if you don't have enough time to wait through the throngs of people who will be lined up here for the next several um, tens of minutes, <laughs> then there are some pre-signed books 
available in the next room directly through those doors and across the hall. There are books that Ken signed you. Do you say it's Sir Ken Robinson or Ken Robinson? How do you do that? My leash. My leash. <laughs> Got it. So those are available over there. So custom signed books here. And yes, Ken? So the last thing. I, I, I didn't thank James and Kate, my son and daughter, our son and daughter, for coming. Here they are. Thank you for coming as well. That, so that, that, that's just to avoid a very uncomfortable scene later on. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. And got a copy of Creative School. You may. Matt, thank you so much. Oh.